Hi everyone, and welcome to the Pearly Cute channel. So icebergs have become super popular videos. I absolutely love watching them. They're like my little guilty pleasure. And I really, really wanted to do a Lanita iceberg for the longest time, but I just didn't think there was that much to talk about. Like I had maybe 10 or so ideas and I kind of threw it out on Instagram. Um, if anyone else had any ideas for my Lolita Iceberg video, and oh my gosh, <laughs> so many people did. So there's actually a lot of weirdness within the Lolita community, and I've created an iceberg of my own, but honestly, I don't think it's finished. I've added about 40 things, and there's so much more. Even while writing out these 40 things on the iceberg, I thought of more things that I could add to it. So it's in no means finished. I feel like this is going to be a very deep iceberg. <laughs> I don't even know how I'm going to get these 40 things done, but because there are so many things, um, I am quickly going to say, if you don't know what an iceberg video is, uh, too bad. <laughs> that's all the explanation you're getting. No, that's, that's a lie. I am going to tell you what an iceberg video is really quickly. So basically the idea of an iceberg is that it's, you only see a tiny bit of the iceberg at the top and then there's like a lot of iceberg at the bottom under the water. And it's the same with like fandoms and things. So there are things that people know and then there's loads of like mysterious things that not everyone knows about it. So that's really the idea here. <laughs> so now you know a little bit about what fandom icebergs are. Let's get into the Lolita fashion iceberg. So Behind the Bows is a live journal page that replaced its predecessor, Lolita Secrets. It was way more popular in its heyday when other J Fashion Secret pages were around, like Yari Secrets. I think most of us know what Behind the Bows is, but in case you don't, it's basically a place where you can post gossip and secrets and humour. It's kind of like the funniest part of Lolita humour. May she rest in peace. <laughs> and the meanest parts of CGL mixed into one. It's still around, so if you want to, you can go and check it out. Mana is to many of the older Lolitas the face of the fashion, and although in recent years he's kind of slunk into the background, uh, he is still such a massive pioneer of the fashion, and he's coined so many terms and started so many trends. However, <laughs> even though he is such a massive figurehead within the community, none, <laughs> but a select few, have ever heard his voice. To get around this, he always has an assistant who will speak on his behalf. Any time he wants to say something, he basically just whispers into his assistant's ear, and then the assistant will say it out loud. Um, and the assistant is, I think that he always gets a female assistant because the idea is that because he dresses as a woman, he doesn't want to use a manly voice to basically break the immersion of it. He doesn't want to ruin the immersion, guys. So he doesn't like to use his masculine voice. He wants to use a feminine voice. So that is why he will never, ever speak out loud. So Jewelry Jelly is quite a weird dress. It was released in 2010, um, but even then I think people knew something was off about it. So when you look at the print images versus the stock photos, you can see that the colour saturation is very different between them. The print image is much more saturated than the actual dress came out. But it was a super cute dress and so I think people just decided to overlook this completely. And also, print desaturation had never been an issue before. All their dresses were less saturated than the print images, so it wasn't really uncommon, but this one definitely was more desaturated than its print image than other dresses were. However, 10 years on, and it is really hard to find a jewellery jelly which looks like jewellery jelly. <laughs> For some reason, this dress did not stand the test of time and it faded extremely quickly to the point where the print is basically white. <laughs> this has made it completely undesirable to people and it tends to not sell well, except for recently. During this weird sweet boom, can people stop buying old AP, please? <laughs> 
<laughs> They're taking my aesthetic. I don't appreciate it. Now, all old AP dresses fade. We have seen this across the board. If you have an old AP dress that's made of cotton, it has faded. But none faded in the same way that jewellery jelly did. It became pretty apparent that something had gone wrong with jewellery jelly. Now, I couldn't find exact proof of this theory, but it is a theory that I have heard multiple times. Which is, there was a factory error where it printed far too light and Angelic Frizzy just decided to roll with it and release it anyway instead of reprinting. Again, I cannot confirm this to be true, but it does sound likely since it was so desaturated at the beginning. I just hope that AP decide to re-release this. You guys know that I don't like polyester, but I think this is one of the few dresses that I think maybe they should print in poly just so that they can get a good saturated look because the print itself is absolutely gorgeous, but it have just never done well on the dresses. Even when they were first released, it didn't look like the beauty that was in the print images. <laughs> so I'd really appreciate if AP gave this another go. In 2008, Angelic Pretty released a cupcake themed dress called Whipped Magic. And pretty much immediately there was mass hysteria throughout the Lolita community. <laughs> why would anyone ever bring out a dress this awful? You? Why is there green cupcakes? <laughs> Are they made from bogeys? <laughs> This is the ugliest effing dress I've ever seen. Those cupcakes look radioactive. And thus, <laughs> the name Radioactive Cupcakes was born. So I don't actually know if that's how it went down. I couldn't actually find exactly when uh, within the Lolita community we decided to call this dress Radioactive Cupcake. But something I do know is that when AP was later asked uh, about their inspiration, for whipped magic, they said that they actually got inspiration for it when they went on a trip to the US and saw some cupcakes in a bakery. They were like, let's make a dress from these weird looking cupcakes. True story. So whipped magic is the USA dress. This dress was a massive failure to the point where it sold for around $40 on lace market, which is 25 pounds. So if you're looking for a cheap dress, but no matter what, Honestly, radioactive cupcakes will always have a place in my heart. So this is probably one of the most talked about mysteries surrounding Lolita fashion. Where did the name come from? Is the fashion really related to the Nabokov book? So. There's just way too many theories surrounding this for me to explain them all. There's the... It was just a cute name picked at random theory. There's the Saint Dolores theory, the Lolita complex theory, the ironic name theory, the they just thought the story was about a cute girl theory, and I'm sure countless others. But things like this are really messy and we will probably never actually know the truth behind why the fashion is called Lolita. It's probably likely a mixture of all the theories. And since uh, no one is stepping forward to give us the cold, hard, honest truth, <laughs> I asked you guys what you thought the origin story was. I asked for wrong answers only, and this is what you guys gave me. The book. <laughs> I feel like that one's cheating. <laughs> also, a lot of people said, Lot. It came from the two terms lol and eater because we used to like laugh at eaters or we laughed so much that it hurt and so we'd be like lol I die. Uh, one of my favourites, it's the girl version of Brunita. <laughs> oh it all makes sense. It was Manasama's name in a past life. It was appropriation gone too far. <laughs> it's in my Kira's real name. <laughs> Just misheard song lyrics. <laughs> That's how a lot of things start. Every single girl who wears the fashion is called Dolores, so we just all go by our nicknames. It's an acronym of lots of lace in this attire. So <laughs> just wrote America. We don't know if someone else had it before, but we liked it, so we took it. That's it. <laughs> My personal favourite. It was actually a mistranslation of fajita. <laughs> I don't know why I find that one so funny. I actually also submitted my own to Instagram. 
and I, I don't know if anyone noticed, but my one was that an angel appeared in front of Mana one night and told him, do not be afraid, <laughs> for he was to be the parent of a new and exciting fashion, and he was to name this fashion Lolita. Uh, as it says in Gothic Lolita Bible, <laughs> this is not a fashion, it's a religion. It's actually a replica of the And Romeo dress, but it's so infamous, I think probably we already knew that. So I feel like Missy Ann and Bodyline could have their own iceberg, to be fair. <laughs> There is so much to talk about them. Misty Ann was the owner of the brand Bodyline for a really long time. Um, and he did a lot of questionable things when he was in charge. The model competitions, the proposing to the winners of the model competitions, the refusing to send the models their items after they rejected his marriage proposals, the weird attire he wore, the creepy visits he did to other countries, this photo, the body pillow, <laughs> the Missy and So Furious sale, the list goes on. He was such a shady character. In 2012, the brand Baby the Stars Shine Bright brought out a range of novelty items, and among them was a pen that Lolitas everywhere were immediately drawn to. Anyway, Baby thought that it would be super cute to bring out a pen with their beloved mascot Usukumya on the top of it. What could possibly go wrong? Well, probably nothing. But it seemed that they didn't have anyone to actually check the final design because when you look at it, <laughs> Usukumya's placement is somewhat precarious. <laughs> Although I couldn't find the exact origin of Hover Lolly, this meme came around about 2011. The idea was that the Lolita silhouette looked like a rocket, and so Gar started photoshopping their images to remove their legs and hover above the ground. Some even added little rocket jets underneath their skirts to literally make it look like they were blasting off. However, now this term is mostly used on CGL when people talk about coordinates. It's used to refer to a coordinate that looks really nice on top, but the leg wear and shoes let it down. I think it's a fairly obscure meme that a lot of new Lolitas don't really understand, but there you go, that's the origin. <laughs> In 2011, Bodyline released one of its most popular prints, Squirrel Party, and with a price of $50, there didn't really seem to be any downsides to it. The dress quickly sold out, and it was super sought after within the Lilith community at the time. I remember really wanting to get my hands on it, but having to wait until it was restocked. But to our joy, in 2015, the dress was restocked, and again, it sold out very, very quickly. However, when people started getting this dress, they noticed that something was off. The print was backwards. For some people, the print covering the whole dress was mirrored. For others, it was just the bodice. Now, it's really, really common for Japanese companies to not accept returns. Um, and Bodyline was not the exception. It didn't accept returns, but it also stated that it did not accept returns for damaged goods, so no one could return these dresses. However, it actually became a bit of a meme within the Lolita community, and you actually had people asking to buy the backwards prints over the normal print because of how funny it was. And even to this day, you can find people selling the backwards print. I know Kelly Eden probably doesn't like people talking about this, but seeing the whole situation was really like watching reality TV. We loved to see it, we loved to discuss it. So in 2017, a YouTuber by the name Kelly Eden won uh, the title of Kawaii Icon, or whatever it was, by Kai International, and uh, went to Japan to receive the prize? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how it works. <laughs> 
And during this trip to Japan, she bought a dress from Angelic Pretty. Now, if you've watched my Angelic Pretty collection review videos, you will know that Angelic Pretty bring out two lines for every collection. They bring out their standard line, which is the one that people usually wear, and they bring out their super expensive bougie line, which is like thousand pound dresses that barely anyone owns. Well, Kelly bought a bougie dress from Angelic Pretty without realizing that she had spent $1,500 on this dress. She actually thought she was getting it for a bargain of $150. So when she found out that she had made this mistake, obviously she wanted her money back. But Japan has very different standards to the West, as I said previously, and they don't really accept returns. Um, a lot of people also said that this is something to do with their culture, but it's not. It's just that it's not law that they have to, like, accept returns. <laughs> and so they don't, because <laughs> they're capitalists. <laughs> But anyway, they don't do returns, is all you need to know. So instead of accepting this and learning from her mistake, <laughs> Kelly decided that she was going to act as a complete victim and make her friend hound Angelic Pretty and <laughs> give her a refund, basically. And she did get that refund in the end. And if this had been the whole story, then... <laughs> I mean, they should have given her a refund. She might not have been able to afford food, who knows? So yes, she did need that refund. Um, but it was the way that she went and made a whole video talking trash about Angelic Pretty afterwards that really caught the attention of the Lolita community. She was just really rude about them. And as I said before, she acted like a complete victim. But that is all I'm going to say on the situation. If you want to know more, watch Law's video on the whole thing. Kelly has actually deleted her video on it, so if you want to get some context, Law has a great video about it. So now we all know about Behind the Bows, but did you know that it had a sister page called Delita Valentine's? Here you could send in a picture of your friend or someone you admired or your community or anyone who wore Delita really and say something really nice about them and it would get posted every Saturday. It was just a really nice way of telling someone or the community that you really appreciated them. Um, however, the live journal closed down and it's now on Facebook. They don't post every Saturday, but I think they do do special posts every now and again, like one a year or so. EGL Com Sales was the original place to buy and sell Alita within the West. There's not much more to it, but looking at it, I'm grateful that Lace Market exists because the Com Sales were incredibly daunting to a new Lolita. Lucky for me, I never actually had to use them because Facebook sales were becoming extremely popular when I started wearing Lolita. This was before Lace Market existed. Now, the com sales is pretty much just a historical page where you can go and look at how cheap Angelic Pretty used to be. <laughs> So this is a meme that is still referred to pretty often <laughs> when it comes to Lucky Packs. I remember when this happened and I was actually waiting on a Bodyline Lucky Pack myself, so this made me really nervous. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, in 2014, Bodyline announced that it was going to do its own Lucky Packs. A lot of brands brought out Lucky Packs every new year and Bodyline decided it was going to do the same thing. These were super, super cheap. And you could choose between, I think it was Lolita, cosplay, and was it like a wig one? I think they were doing wig ones as well, I can't remember. But no one really knew what was going to be inside, and given Bodyline's amazing reputation, <laughs> everyone uh, wanted to watch others try it first before they decided to buy. But it has to be said that everyone was very intrigued by it, because Bodyline does have some really good wardrobe fillers, and if they were giving these wardrobe fillers away in the Lucky Packs, then a lot of people would have wanted to buy them. However, even though the majority of people were too terrified to buy them, <laughs> A handful of people, including myself, <laughs> decided that we would throw away our money, and that was okay. <laughs> One of these people was a Tumblr user by the screen name Donberry Tonberry, who ordered a Lolita Lucky Pack as soon as they were available. However, when her Lucky Pack arrived on January the 15th, <laughs> she found a massive surprise within. Inside her Lucky Pack 
with three left side and 14 right side detachable sleeves without any sign of a blouse to attach them to. She did actually get some actual items in the lucky pack as well, but obviously the story of the 14 right detachable sleeves spread like wildfire around the Lolita community. And even to this day, everyone still refers back to the 14 right detachable sleeves. <laughs> Also, just a side note, Donvery Tomvery actually got 50% back on her lucky pack because of the mistake, which wasn't very much like Bodyline, that wasn't their usual customer service, um, but they did actually give her half off, uh, and I think she decided to keep the detachable sleeves, <laughs> so if you need an extra one, <laughs> hit your girl up. In 2001, Angelic Pretty had a massive overhaul. They brought on Asuka, who is one of the two faces of modern day Angelic Pretty, and their image started to slightly shift. Along with these changes, they decided to change their name as well. Before, AP was just called Pretty, which isn't a very Lolita brand name. It definitely needed to be longer, hence Angelic Pretty. <laughs> For some reason, knees in the litre have always been a heavily contested subject. Should you show them? Shouldn't you? People are a lot more relaxed about them now, but it used to be a major and unbreakable rule within the Lolita community that you should not show your knees. So are hidden knees a staple of Lolita fashion? No, <laughs> they're not. <laughs> It was actually never a rule. No one ever said that your knees should be hidden. It was actually all down to a mistranslation by someone who wasn't even in the Lilita community. Misako Oki was judging a contest and a video was made around the contest. And in this video, uh, she said something about the gap in between your OTKs and your skirt, as this is a heavily fetishized thing in Japan. She wasn't saying that it was a rule as well to not have this gap. She was more saying, I don't like the gap and uh, I don't want the fashion to be sexualized in that way. But whoever decided to translate this decided to uh, replace <laughs> what Misako actually said and say that Misako said knees should not be in the liter, thus sparking this new weird rule within the West. Ah, the infamous con we cannot speak of lest we get a cease and desist letter in the post. <laughs> there are threads and threads on the CGL archives detailing what happened, and if you're curious, you should make sure you've got a few hours free, grab a bucket of tea, 10 packs of biscuits, and dive right in. I will just say though, that the lesson to take away from this is do not be a terrible human being and get too big for your boots. You will slip up and you will lose everything. What about Fantastic Dolly, hmm? Well, there is no such thing as the Fantastic Dolly print. It doesn't exist. There is no Fantastic Dolly. What you own is Fantastic Dolly. There is no T after the S and there never has been. I have no idea if this was intentional or a typo that they just decided to roll with, but the print is called Fantastic Dolly. Anything else is purely incorrect. In late 2013, a new website called Lacebook popped up on the radar. It was invite only, so you had to know someone who was already a member to join. It seemed like the idea behind this was to keep people uh, who didn't wear Lolita, uh, who were sissies or other degenerates out of the community. It seemed like a good idea. It was a place to chat about Lolita and post cord shots without getting unwanted attention, but it just never really took off. So it closed a few years after. Honestly, I think it could have worked, but it needed more features. I was a member for a short time <laughs> and I just remember it being extremely basic and very boring and basically uh, just another place to put your looks. So it just didn't really catch on. Oh well. Rest in peace, Lace Market. Rest in peace. Okay, for some reason, <laughs> we all remember the Moitié casket, 
but has anyone actually ever seen it? No, because it doesn't exist. I actually swear I wrote this one down and then Googled it and I couldn't find anything on it. So I scratched it off my list and then I asked everyone about it <laughs> and someone else brought it up and I was like, it wasn't just me imagining it, there was a Moitié casket. We all collectively made it up, <laughs> there is no Moitié casket. This probably seems like the Mandela effect in action, but it's actually very explainable. In 2011, MC Melody Doll, the Lolita parody rapper, brought out her first song, Throw It In The Bag, in which she raps the lyrics. <clears throat> when I die, I'll be buried in a moitié casket. This is the only time a moitié casket has ever been mentioned. Now I know some of you are probably scratching your heads because you are sure you have seen the Moitié casket, but what you have actually seen <laughs> is the Victorian Maiden casket. <laughs> the classic Lolita brand Victorian Maiden <laughs> brought out a purchasable coffin in 2001, which was actually re-released in 2018. So, if you want to be buried in brand, <laughs> literally, you could buy this casket. Although I'd be, I'd be a bit cautious of how well it would hold up after being buried under all of the mud and dirt. <laughs> I don't think it would hold up very well. It was definitely more a casket for show. Sure. <laughs> but there you go. That's the mystery of the Moitié casket. Usakumiya wasn't always as adorable as she is today. She actually used to look like this. Stage dress. Nope, I don't know why either. So replica dresses have always been a little bit off and a little bit obvious. You could always tell when someone was wearing one, but things changed in 2015. Replicas started becoming closer and closer to the originals, and one replica that really caught the community's eye was Cream Cookie Collection. The only way that you could actually tell that this was a replica was by its lack of tag. And if you ask me, the replica actually looks better than the original. <laughs> anyway, this kind of changed the standard for replicas, um, but it also shifted the community's mindset surrounding replicas. Up until this point, replicas had not been like seen as great, but they hadn't been seen as so much of a problem because it was very obvious to tell when something was a replica and so it wasn't like people were really trying to trick you, it was just, oh, you bought a replica. But this spot on thread for thread, literally the same replica, completely turned everyone off replicas. No one could really back replicas when they were just too close to the original. I think nowadays everyone's pretty much on the same wave about dress replicas, they just don't really have any place within the Lolita community. So you all know Lollibrary, but did you know that before Lollibrary there was Hello Lace? It was basically the same thing, but it had a lot of the older items on there, and when it suddenly closed down in late 2015, a lot was lost. So I completely forgot that these were actually a thing for a while. Um, and I forgot how crazy people went over trying to become one. It's so hard to find information about Kawaii Ambassadors now, um, but this is what I know. So around 2009, Misako Aoki created the Japan Lolita Association, which was more of an international Lolita Association. I don't know why she named it like that, but it was called the JLA. The idea was to showcase Lolitas and events all over the world. And in order to do so, Misako would appoint kawaii ambassadors. So whenever Misako came to a large event in a country, she would hold a contest to appoint uh, one or two new kawaii ambassadors. I really can't actually remember the details of the contest that well. Um, and I do remember really, really wanting her to come to the UK so that she could appoint a UK um, ambassador, but I'm... <laughs> Really glad she didn't, and <laughs> you will find out why. <laughs> so in 
So if I recall correctly, in order to win the contest, you had to fit a few boxes. One, you had to be a Lolita, obviously. <laughs> Two, you had to be an active member of your community. Uh, you had to organise meets and events. Three, you had to be cute. And four, you had to have some popularity within your community. I think Misako ultimately decided who would become the next Kawaii ambassador, but the country's com also had quite a large say in it. It was all quite wholesome, to be fair, and it gave people an idea of who was a decent member of the community. Um, it was never based on just popularity numbers alone, like Kawaii International's contests. So you got people with smaller followings and more unknown people becoming Kawaii ambassadors just because of how much they uh, did for the community and how much the community appreciated them. However, in 2016, everything kind of fell apart when Misako announced that she would be choosing the US's first Kawaii ambassador. And she was going to do this at Houston's Anime Matsuri. <laughs> And Anime Matsuri, being the self-centred convention that it was, decided to make a massive deal about this. They flew in a lot of the other kawaii ambassadors from all over the world, um, as if they were celebrities, <laughs> and made some massive and extremely cringy deal over it. Uh, everyone was pretty sure who they knew was going to be the next kawaii ambassador. Everyone was talking online, obviously, we were all talking online, and we were all pretty sure we knew who the next Kawaii ambassador would be. But when it actually came to announcing the first ever US Kawaii ambassador, someone who wasn't affiliated with the com at all was picked. <laughs> you see, Anime Matsuri had pretty much bribed Misako into choosing a Lolita who worked very closely with the convention itself as the next Kawaii ambassador. So when everyone found out about it, that was pretty much it for the JLA and Kawaii ambassadors. Knowing that they were so heavily associated now with Anime Matsuri and all the stuff that had come out about Anime Matsuri, um, people did not like the idea of Kawaii ambassadors anymore. And a lot of the Kawaii ambassadors actually uh, said that they didn't want to be Kawaii ambassadors anymore. And so we saw a lot of people basically jumping ship. <laughs> and stopping being Kawaii ambassadors. Nowadays, the JLA website and Facebook is still up there, so you can go and have a look at them, but they're very, very dead, very derelict. Um, there are still a few Kawaii ambassadors out there, but I don't think Misako is picking any more. So this one's probably a lot less well-known, but in 2015, the Chinese brand Cradland Ret held a tea party in London with the UK Community Tea Party Club. This is where everyone's woes began. <laughs> During that tea party, Crad allowed people to pre-order some of their dresses that had not come out yet, that were shown in the fashion show. And they got a lot of orders. A few months went by and no one had really heard about their orders and a lot of people decided to take to Facebook to kind of ask, hey, has anyone else heard about these orders? <laughs> and it actually turned out that they were not alone in this. Uh, other people who were ordering through their Facebook and their Etsy had also not heard anything about things that they had ordered from Cradland Rep. On top of this, the tracking numbers that customers were given at purchase didn't work. And obviously, <laughs> mass panic ensued. <laughs> PayPal claims were being filed left, right and center. <laughs> but Crad was completely silent throughout this whole thing. It was literally as if they had disappeared off the face of the earth, with everyone's cash <laughs> in what had seemed like an elaborate scam. Obviously a lot of people were upset. There were multiple pre-orders at the tea party and some people had spent upwards of £500 on these new um, dresses uh, without a word. Uh, other people were receiving their orders, but they were getting them in the wrong sizes, wrong colours, um, and things were just going wrong pretty much for everyone. And when they went back to customer service, they heard nothing. But luckily, <laughs> this story actually has a happy ending, with an employee finally stepping in and cleaning up this mess. This story has a lot more to it, uh, with the Chinese brand having 
no idea what was actually happening uh, with its international customers. In the end, a lot of damage had been done, and to this day, people still don't really trust this major Chinese brand. Back in ye old live journal days existed something called Get Off EGL. So these days people use, I don't know, like CGL or like lolcow <laughs> for this stuff, but back then people used Get Off EGL. The idea was that if you had a nasty interaction with someone, be it a scalper, a bad event host, someone attention seeking to the extremes, or just a plain, simple, annoying eater, you could post about them to get off EGL to let off some steam. Even though its last posts were dated to after I got into Lolita, uh, I never actually knew about this site until a year or two afterwards. Looking back on it now, it did have some use, like warning others about scammers and scalpers, but it was also used just to be mean to noobs. <laughs> if I got a pound for every time the word noob was used on Get Off EGL, I could buy Puppet Circus. <laughs> anyway, it remains a little piece of Lolita history which you can peruse at your leisure. It takes more than beauty to be a queen. It takes true talent. And I don't know about you, but I've never seen a Lolita model look at her feet the way Queen Model Sand did. That regal, downturned glance straight at those new brand shoes. You know you'll buy replicas of next year. The slight smile that says both, you will never know who I am, and these shoes are too tight. Her sudden abdication of her throne at the height of her reign, leaving her dumpy younger sister to reign in her stead? Model San may have left us, but we will never have a queen that can compare to her. Who cares if she's pretty? Pretty girls wish they were Model San. She is so classic and iconic that I bet someday Innocent World will release a dress where her face is the edge print. And I can't speak for you, infidels, but I know I will be the first in its reservation queue. Also, is it me? Or does she kind of look like Draco Malfoy? So in 2012, Nickelodeon debuted their new Mexican teen comedy drama show, Miss XV. Now I've never watched it, but I assume that it was your run of the mill Nick show. Think iCarly and Victorious. And much like in the way that every Nickelodeon and Disney Channel show of that time, the stars of Miss XV also created music outside of the show and formed a band called EME15. Everything honestly would have been fine and we probably wouldn't even know about this show and the band uh, had it not been for the butchering of Lolita dresses. Whoever was in charge of styling somehow managed to get their hands on a pink honey cake JSK as well as two decoration dreams. This meta dress, I'm pretty sure it's a meta dress, um, and a few non-printed Lilith dresses as well, and decided to make them all really, really <laughs> short. This obviously really infuriated Lilithas, especially since Honey Cake in Pink was and is still so rare. And now, there was one less in the world. <sighs> Rest in peace, dresses. <sighs> Rest in peace. <laughs> Side note though, <laughs> they also performed in these dresses and am I the only one who kind of thinks it's a vibe? Like I don't actually hate it. <laughs> So not only have Nickelodeon stars donned our fashion, but also big name celebrities too. Katy Perry, Nicki Minaj, Lil Mama, Jessica Simpson, and Amy Lee are just a few to name. In 2016, a new substar rose into prominence. <laughs> Bread Lisa. <laughs> 
for some reason, several brands decided to bring out bread themed prints and Lolitas everywhere were loving it. Many were flocking to get their hands on one of these dresses and some were even questioning if they had even truly cared about Lolita before the bread. Of course, no one really took the whole bread thing that seriously. It was all just a joke, guys. R right? <laughs> Funashi is the Japanese mascot of Funabashi city in Chiba and for some reason <laughs> they decided they wanted to collaborate with some Lolita brands. So in 2014 Angelic Pretty bought out the Funashi Katsu uh, tote bag and badge set and honestly I have a mighty need for this Katsu. It's beautiful. It's actually stunning. It's beautiful. It's everything I could ever want in my life. <laughs> but Funashi wasn't satisfied with that. They wanted more. <laughs> so in 2015, they collaborated with Baby the Stars Shine Bright and they brought out one of the greatest items I have ever seen. Funashi wearing Creamy Berry Fairy Dream and the infamous Elizabeth OP. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> now you and Funashi can twin. <laughs> Is there anything you would want more in life than this? So I don't know if anyone remembers Sweet Rococo, but when I first got into Lolita, I used to spend absolutely ages on this site. Basically, you could design your own Lolita dress on the site with a choice of different fabrics, buttons, lace trims, and they would make the dress for you. And not only could you design main pieces, but other things too, like bloomers and blouses. It was honestly so much fun. <laughs> the amount of time that I wasted on this site is unreal. <laughs> the printed fabrics made some questionable pieces, but the solids looked so good. <laughs> Unfortunately, the site closed December the 1st, 2013, and we've never really had anything like it since. To celebrate the new year in 2014, the brand Metamorphose Tom Stuffy brought out a new happy pack print called Swan Garden, which, as you probably guessed, featured swans and gardens. <laughs> but people noticed something off about this print. If you glance at this print without really looking at the details properly, the garden part of this print seemed to resemble the infamous Nazi symbol. A few people noticed this and it became known as the Meta Swastika Dress. In December 2013, a question was put out to those on CGL. Can we have an Eater Stories thread? Most people replied with mundane stories about new Lolitas in the com, or about those who refused to put in the effort to improve. But one and on <laughs> brought something much better. The story of Danger Cham. This is simultaneously one of the worst and best Lolita stories out there. And even though we will never know if it's true or not, it's one I like to reread often. <laughs> to summarize, this story is about an extreme edgelord with a severe attitude problem who tries to steal dresses from some kind com members. It's a roller coaster from start to finish, and I really recommend you read it for yourself. <laughs> This one will grind your gears, please be warned. <laughs> so this individual named Darcy wrote a piece for her blog called the Anti Lolita Tutorial and also decided that it would be a good idea to make a video going along with it. So what was this Anti Lolita Tutorial? Well, she had apparently looked into what Lolita was and had tried to mimic Lolita makeup <laughs> and then proceeded to tell everyone that her Lolita makeup made her look like she was trying to be a dumb baby and that Lolita was a disgusting appeal to men and that self-respecting girls shouldn't wear the Lolita style. <laughs> I used many many inverted commas there because, surprise, surprise, this woman had done 
no research into what Lolita was at all. She had taken pictures of girls in maid uniforms and had said that this was Lolita fashion and that they were just sexualizing themselves for attention and that this was anti-feminist. She had gotten absolutely nothing except the name right throughout the whole blog post and video and instead of making the educated and woke points that she thought she was trying to make, she actually just made herself look like a fool in front of a whole load of people. Luckily, there was a lot of backlash, so much so that she deleted the blog post and her video, um, and all that remains of it today is the brilliant video made by 42 Believer, which you should go and check out if you're interested to know more about the whole ordeal. Again, warning, it will grind your gears. <laughs> In 2016, an anonymous user posted to CGL about an unfortunate situation she had found herself in. She wrote, Due to some unusual circumstances, I'm currently living in a partially renovated house with my dad and his fiance. His fiance is a very sweet lady who is very thrifty. She makes all her own clothes and will usually find a practical use for something rather than throw it out. I had a baby the starshine bright strawberry and cherry ruffle jump skirt that I didn't wear anymore so I was planning to sell it. From memory it cost about $400. I put it out in the main room next to a pile of clothes I planned to donate to Good Sammy's so I'd remember to take photos of it for the sale. I then went away for a week to visit my grandparents. When I came back I noticed the pile of clothes had disappeared. Cool, my dad and all his fiance had donated them for me. But wait, where was the jumper skirt? It was then that I saw the site portrayed in the uploaded. My dress had been cut up to make an ironing board cover and a tablecloth. I don't know where the rest of the material is. It appeared that my dad's fiance had assumed the jumper skirt was part of the donation pile and thought there was no harm in recycling it for her own uses. In her efforts to pretty up the concrete wasteland of a house, she had unknowingly destroyed an expensive brand dress. Literally, the only thing I could do in that moment was stare blankly. I can't even be mad at her, she had no idea. So, now I have a BTSSB ironing board and tablecloth. The fury I feel in my bones when reading this. I don't know how she kept her cool, I would have been livid. But ultimately, she was right. There's nothing you can do about it. Hopefully she got to keep the ironing board cover and tablecloth. Gosh, 2016. <laughs> 2016, mate. <laughs> So for some reason, in 2008, Alice and the Pirates decided to release this cutso, which on the front read, Revolutionary Revolution, Flying House or Flying... I don't know what it means. Please don't ask. Story of the Stolen Dress. In January 2015, Someone posted a confession to the 4chan board, CGL, that read, This girl I hate threw a massive party that she invited all the regulars of our com to, and I snuck into her room and stole her iron gate skirt. I would have taken more, but it was all that I could fit into my bag. It sucks because I can't wear it until I move, but it was so worth it to see her standing in the com deteriorate from adamantly blaming six different people for taking it after the fact. I wasn't even one of the suspects because she thinks I adore her too much to do that for some reason. At first, people called out this person for telling a fake story, but it turned out that someone had actually stolen an iron gate skirt and that there was actually some truth to this story. We still don't know if that anon was trying to frame someone or if the iron gate skirt was ever returned, but it was a roller coaster ride from start to finish. In June 2014, an anonymous user told CG out the story of how she had recently bought a Marie biscuit brooch and had left it out on a hot day just to find that it had cracked in her absence. But instead of the clean crack you'd expect from clay or resin, this had crumbs coming out. So she posed a question to her anonymous audience. Should she glue it back together or split it more and reveal its secrets? What commenced was a hilarious thread in which a community came together to laugh at the strangeness of the situation. She pried the biscuit open more and uploaded the pictures. There was no way that this was anything but a real biscuit. It's definitely a thread to check out if you need a good laugh. 
So this is a few of the weird, um, mysterious and unknown things within the Lolita community and there's definitely more things. So if you have anything to add to the iceberg, let me know in the comment section down below. Um, I will try and link as much of this as well in the description box. So if you want to check out one of these stories or anything, as long as I can find it, um, then I will put them down there in the description uh, so that you can peruse to your heart's content. <laughs> so thank you all so much for watching, I'm starving, I'm going to go and get myself some lunch now, and as always thank you for liking, commenting and subscribing, and I will see you in my next video. Bye! Mwah!